I don't think there are many better pastimes than spending a bit of time in the back garden doing this. Yeah, you can't beat a bit of riveting. And of course, if you get them wrong, they're out of the job, get one out, you know, sort of thing. I don't suppose riveting would be everybody's idea of having a good time. A day at the seaside or an amusement park would be a bit more like it for most people. But what people enjoy doing in the spare time varies a lot. So in this programme, we're going to be looking at a whole lot of different places that have been built for our leisure and pleasure. As well as visiting Blackpool, I'll be going to places like theatres and museums but I'm starting off with a visit to one of our earliest and best preserved places of leisure. The city of Bath is very important because it has the only hot springs in the country and this is what made it very important to the Romans. The Romans developed Bath into a city of leisure and pleasure and of course they built around the hot springs a wonderful system of baths and, and, you know, all what we can see here in actual fact. The, the thing is that along with Adrian's Wall, it's one of the grandest monuments that the Roman Empire left behind for us. The main feature is the Great Bath, which of course is still fed from the hot springs by the original Roman plumbing. The baths are a masterpiece of early civil engineering. The hydraulics that control the water flow show a detailed knowledge of the art of taming springs. And the channels that carry the hot water through the bath still function today as the Roman engineers intended them to. The baths were a meeting place and Roman Britons would come here in the afternoon to meet their mates and have a chat. They certainly knew how to enjoy themselves all that time ago. Another amenity the Romans introduced to Britain were theatres. But when they left, the theatres disappeared and they never really made a comeback until the Tudor age. In Tudor times, this area south of the Thames was London's theatre land. And it was known as Bankside and it was the home of Shakespeare's Globe. The theatre was destroyed by fire and no trace of it was left. What we see today is an authentic reconstruction that's only 200 yards away from the original. It was the vision of an American actor, Sam Wanamaker, who was involved with the project right from cutting of the first trees. To get the wood, they had to travel all over the country to find trees of the right size and shape. This peg I've been showing you. Peter uh, McCurdy is, is the master carpenter who was responsible for the, the wall uh, timber frame construction. If we look at the, the, the timber structure here, the, the, these posts actually reflect the bays yeah. inside. That, that's really the, the basis of timber construction, is breaking the structure up into a series of bays. Yeah. So, in fact, if we go up and have a look at these joints, we can see we've got these curved braces, and one's looking for a tree just with that natural curve. This is good, uh, this lovely angle on here. That's right, well, yeah, well, when, so, you know, in, sh in, in buildings that are polygonal like yeah. this, or, or indeed buildings that weren't square in plan, and quite mm. a lot of urban buildings, mm. uh, medieval buildings, they weren't square in plan, they would almost invariably shape the posts yeah. to oh, the actual yeah. angle of the building. So, yeah. of course, this is shaped yeah. 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 Um, approximately 162 mm. degrees. Mm. 
Well, Peter, you know, when you started, there couldn't have been much left of the original. The Globe Theatre suffered from fire and things like yeah, that. Oh, right, yeah. um, of course, being, you know, timber, yeah, timber, timber, timber <laughs> and thatch roof. <laughs> in fact, it was the thatch roof that led to the demise of the first Globe Theatre mm -hmm. because they fired a cannon during the performance of Henry VIII. <laughs> uh, a, li a, a live cannon, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, some of the wadding from the cannon went onto the mm. thatch and uh, the thing caught light and the whole thing was raised to the ground. Mm. Of course, what, what that did was that. I mean, that created rather a problem for anybody wanting to do a reconstruction mm -hmm. because it meant that, uh, that there was really you know, nothing to work from in the way of any tangible physical evidence. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a, number of, uh, there's a number of drawings, a number of illustrations of the, of the theatres that were done at that time. In fact, I've got one here on the end of a peg. Mm -hmm. That shows you how big the illustrations are that we've actually had to work with. Mm -hmm. I mean, the building as we see it and the timbers we see and the joinery details and all the construction details have had to be based on very careful research of mm -hmm. other buildings mm -hmm. which have got similar features and characteristics yeah, to, like the, the, to the, the theatres. Yeah, like the joints for the, with the mortise and tenons and the half right, and all right, the usual right, yeah, joints yeah. all pegged together and one of it. Quite interesting how, how you've got the, the... Oh, it really looks as though it's been sawn with a pit saw. Of course, in 1987, they discovered the Rose Theatre, the archaeology of the Rose okay. Theatre, the foundations. And then in, uh, in 1989, they excavated the, the Globe Theatre site. Mm -hmm. And it's from those, those two pieces of information and also these drawings that we, we've got the overall size of this building, a 100-foot diameter yeah. uh, and a 20-sided polygon. Mm -hmm. So each, each of these bays that you see yeah. here represents a facet on the building. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are 20 of those mm -hmm. as you go around the whole, the whole mm -hmm. circle. The building is really considered or dealt with in two-dimensional planes. Mm. So you don't fabricate a three-dimensional structure, you simply fabricate flat walls. Once they'd done this, they'd have to take it all apart to transport it to the site and then piece it all together again like a jigsaw. It must be one of the biggest timber prefabricated buildings ever made. And there are various uh, r really interesting little refinements that these carpenters evolved to ensure that when they brought all the timbers you know, mm, to site and yeah. put them together, that they actually came together with the right angles. Because mm. obviously, if you didn't have exactly the right angle yeah, in, in yeah, a building like this, a, well, you wouldn't meet. Too long or too <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. might, you might miss like yeah, this, you yeah, know, when you exactly, got around the circle. Yeah. I spent from being 15 years old till I was 22 as a joiner. And I think it's wonderful, you know, everything's oh, really? all been done. And I don't think it could have looked a heck of a lot different, really, when it was, <laughs> you know, first, um, first built, as you might yeah. say. I mean, the principles in, in Sam's uh, sort of conception for this mm. project were to do as accurate a reconstruction as possible. Mm. Peter Street was the original builder, and the way that I've approached it is that I would like to feel that if Peter Street was standing here today talking to you instead of me, yeah, yeah. Uh, that he would feel entirely comfortable, as though, you know, it was yeah, one of his yeah. buildings. One of the things that would have made him feel at home is not just a structure that would have been familiar to him, but the wall design and decoration of the building. In here at the Globe, the curtains and the painting of the stage and the marbling of the columns have all been recreated by craftsmen and women to make it look just as it would have done in Shakespeare's day. By the 18th century, the design and decoration of buildings had become so important that a wall city was built in one style. It was at this time that the old Roman city of Bath was transformed into the most popular leisure resort in England, and it became the summer capital of polite society. The place to go to take the waters and socialise. Towns had usually grown up in a fairly higgledy-piggledy sort of way, but Bath is an example of a town whose war loop was designed for gracious living. It was a Yorkshireman, John Wood, whose vision helped to change the face of Bath. Queen Square is a perfect example of a design layout with all the houses in it built to the same proportions and of the same stone. Its grandest project, the circus, has 30 houses built on a curve round a paved square. When he died, his work was carried on by his son, whose greatest work, the Royal Crescent, has been called the finest crescent in Europe. 
Like his father, the young John Wood was deeply influenced by the classical style of ancient Greece and Imperial Rome. It was another Imperial Age that left us with some of our grandest and most magnificent monuments. The Age of Victoria, when the British Empire was at its peak. The Great Exhibition was held in 1851 to demonstrate the industrial supremacy and the prosperity of Britain. It was a great success and the profits from it were used to establish an area of museums and cultural buildings in South Kensington. The grand facade of the Victoria and Albert Museum was built between 1899 and 1909 to bring uniformity to a group of these buildings that were devoted to the decorative arts. Aston Webb, the architect, actually wanted to bring the outside into the museum in a quite a clever way. What he wanted to do was to create a sort of a buffer zone, mm. if you like, um, using Portland stone, which of course mm. he used on the outside face yeah. of the museum. He actually decided to bring what is normally used mm. outside mm. into exactly. this first mm. area. Mm. It works quite well because mm. in the other part of the entrance, you start to have the walls rendered mm. where the soft blaster actually mm. begins to bring the visitor yeah. into the mm. envelope of the museum. Mm all this lovely marble as well, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, he used, um, in the entrance here, he wanted to use several marbles, and uh, the floor is Carrara mm. marble, of course, also with black Italian mm. marble and also Romanian red marble. I've got a table in my back kitchen with that pink marble on. Right. Believe it or not, exactly the same. Well, when we take it up again, we'll let you have that slab. Oh, you can have another one. Thank you. <laughs> As you get into the museum, you can see that the way, the decoration and the materials used were designed to complement the exhibits. So this staircase was the one that led up to the original ceramics galleries. As we walk up the staircase, the whole structure, in fact, is um, clad in ceramic tile. Mm. And if you look on, on the staircase, the decoration here um, endlessly repeats um, the marrying together of science and art, and in fact, the, yeah, S &A. the yeah. S and A is there yeah, rather than yeah. V and A for mm. Victoria and Albert. Yeah. That's what S and A is yeah. there for. If we actually carry on up the staircase, you can see the above the rails, the handrails, are the painted panels. Well, it's uh, almost like jigsaw, isn't it? It all fits together. Yeah, you know? little hexagonal pieces. Yeah, in fact, yeah, they're all yeah. um, cut up into smaller pieces that look like mosaic mm. tesserae. Yeah. Right? If you look also, though, the vitrified uh, tiling was also carried up into the ceiling as well. You can spend the whole day just admiring the decoration of the buildings without looking at any of the exhibits. But for me, one of the most exciting bits was being able to get up into the roof and see what some of the original buildings would have looked like. We've now actually got inside the um, roof void of the south court now, as you can see, it's had inserted into the South Court in 1952 a, a modern suspended ceiling. But getting into the void here, you can see the original roof structure. Yeah, yeah, and the beautifying. And yeah, the beautifying. Beautiful, beautiful flowers. It was really um, a bolted iron structure uh, with glass roofs, very similar to the construction of, you know, the Crystal Palace. The walls themselves are still decorated with the original paint scheme. Yeah, and gold leaf and everything, eh? Highly Chisels. decorated, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. You can see the, the plaster there, how it's stuck to the lats, uh, which of course are all the gentle curve of the arch, yeah. Even yeah. down to the, um, the decoration running along the eye yeah. sections of the girders mm. here. Every mm. single surface you can see mm. has been gilded decorated, or painted yeah. or stenciled in some way. You see the flanges there, riveted, joining, oh, yeah. the, the, joining the pieces yeah. together. Oh, they were certainly good with the rivets then, men. Absolutely. <laughs> One of the original aims of the museum was to inspire British designers and manufacturers. So here in the cast courts, there's a collection of plaster cast reproductions from some of the world's greatest buildings and monuments that was put together for the benefit of art and design students who couldn't afford to travel abroad to see them for themselves. They include the wall front door of a cathedral and the monumental Trajan's Column from Rome, which they had to chop in half to get in here. 
But when it came to building monuments, the Victorians took some beating. From London, I went all the way up north to Edinburgh to see one of the most famous. This magnificent monument here on Princess Street in Edinburgh was erected in remembrance of Sir Walter Scott, the famous Scottish writer. I don't know why it is. There's 287 steps to the top of this monument. And I've always, all my, through all my career of being a steeplejack, I've always found it easier to go up a straight vertical ladder to the top of anything, really. Shortly after Sir Walter Scott's death, it was decided that they should build a monument in his remembrance. And so it, it was put out for a competition. And there, there were quite a few eminent architects, you know, who wanted the job. But George Mickel Kemp, a joiner from Midlothian, submitted his first drawing. And of course, because of his humble beginnings and the fact that he was only a joiner, they turned him down, you see. But there were nobody really happy on the committee with what they'd received on the first attempt for the, for the competition. So a second batch of drawings were put forward by all the architects. But Mr. Kemp applied again under an assumed name and they picked his drawing and he got the job. And of course, he supervised the, the whole thing from the beginning, but not to the end because when it were halfway up, he went seeing the main contractor one night, terrible foggy night. And he, whether he'd been having a wee dram or not, nobody knows, but he fell in the canal on the way back and drowned. So his, his brother-in-law actually finished off the construction. The capstone were, were placed on the top by Kemp's son. Mr Kemp himself would have been very proud if he could have seen the end product. But even then it weren't finished. After four years, the great 30-ton block of marble that had to come all the way from Italy for the statue of Sir Walter that's in the bottom, Number one, they dropped it in the harbour in Italy, and then when they managed to get it on a boat, when they got it to Leith here in Scotland, they had no gear to get it off. Anyway, it took another two years before the actual statue were completed. Recently, there's been quite a lot of restoration work done on it, and uh, they've used exactly the same stone, but of course, it'll never get as black as what the rest of it is, because there won't be the same amount of smoke in Edinburgh as there used to be. Uh, the thing is that if I did on it, I'd have dobbed a bit of mud on it or make it blend in with the other. It's something I tried when I was redoing some of the stonework on my house. When I bought this house about 40 years ago, it basically were a two up and two down. And of course, as my family got bigger, I, I got to do something about it. So I like built as much on it again. You know, all the wonderful buildings we've been looking at, you know, even castles and all that, they, they've all been messed about with an extended one way and another. Even kings were great DIY men. There have been extensions done to the house in the days of the Earl of Bradford, but they didn't make a very good job of it, you know, they, they completely omitted all the beading and the fancy work. But when I did mine, you know, I thought I'll try and reproduce what they did in 1854. When I first did the, the moulding uh, and the fancy bits, the, the little square pieces were very white material. They stood out like a sore thumb. So I made a, a mixture of mud and water out of the back garden and painted them. And of course, God and the rain has done the rest. They're now quite a, you know, quite a good match for the, with the moulding. Not far from me, we've got a Victorian monument of a different kind and one that's become one of the country's most famous landmarks. Blackpool Tower was built in 1894, and it's really an imitation of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And it helped transform Blackpool into the, one of the biggest and busiest tourist resorts in all of England. The tower is 518 feet high, and what you've got to remember is, when it was built in 1894, there were no aeroplanes and no skyscrapers, and most Victorian people had never been very high off the ground. And to actually have the experience of being 500 feet up in the sky and being able to see 30 miles must have been an unbelievable attraction. 
tower were completed by the famous railway bridge builders Enon and Froud from Manchester. Here on the maintenance level, it gives you some idea what it's all about, you know, I mean, basically it, it's four latticework towers all leaning inwards and braced together with these big three inch, three and a half inch diameter diagonal tie rods to, you know, stabilise the wall structure. And they tell me in a 70 mile an hour gale, it only moves an inch at the top. The North Pier is even older than the tower, and it was designed by a gentleman called Eugenius Birch. That's some name, isn't it? And he decided that he would build it out of cast iron stanchions instead of the much stronger wrought iron. And his argument against the wrought iron was, if a ship crashed into it, it would bend it and buckle it and twist it. If a ship crashed into his cast iron stanchions, it'd bust a few and they'd be able to replace them. I think that was a good idea myself. I do indeed. The pier was opened in 1863, and in the first 12 months, it, it attracted a quarter of a million punters, you know, who paid a penny a piece to get on it. And of course, the pier company were trying to attract like an higher class of, of holiday maker, and they only had two kiosks on, one sold tobacco and the other sold books, and of course, there were no beer. Not long afterwards came the Central Pier, which of course catered for the working classes who came here on trains. And a great venue for opener dancing and loud music that went on into the night. A stark contrast to the middle classes on the North Pier. By the beginning of the 20th century, Blackpool had become firmly established as Britain's favourite seaside resort, and it was attracting millions of visitors every year. And after the fresh air of the piers and the promenade during the day, the evening was the time for the fun of the theatre. Blackpool was fast becoming a great centre for popular entertainment, and theatres were springing up everywhere all over the place. This is the grandest of all the grand theatres, the Grand, designed by Frank Matcham, and it took only nine months to build. How the heck they did it, all this beautiful plaster, I'll never know, you know. Very quick, I think they'd be hard-pressed in this day and age to accomplish the same thing. It's amazing how Matcham managed to get 1,200 people in such a small space, you know. I mean, his great thing were his, his lavish interiors, all this beautiful ornamental plaster work and lots and lots of different sort of styles in it. Matcham used the cantilever design to support the circles. Basically, what that means is, is like the girders came out of the wall and like radiated into the center of that great curve that you can see, which of course gives the wall thing great strength. I rather think it must have bent a bit when a big pop band were on and the place is full of kids all jumping up and down. They've been pulling in the crowds in Blackpool for over a hundred years now. And the latest attraction is as impressive for its engineering as it is for the excitement of riding on it. This is the latest engineering feat here at Blackpool on the front. It's the Pepsi Max Big One, and it's the biggest roller coaster in the world. It's 235 feet high, and the carriages go at 85 miles an hour. That's really fast. I think I'm going to go and have a go. Goodbye, I'll see you later. It's about two minutes, I think. <laughs>
Speed and her brush. Please exit to the left. I want to meet the man who first commissioned it. <laughs> you must have been very brave. One of the mechanics told me, he said, I said, it's a bit bumpy, isn't it? You know, it could do with some springs. He said, ah, well, if the morning wears on, it runs smoother, you know, the wheels get a bit soft. The solid, you see. Polystyrene or something, polypropylene or something. Poly something to the loom. Well, I mean, just got off the Pepsi big one. You know, all as I can say is it must be a nerve-wracking business being in charge of a place like this and a machine like that. And then this is Jim who's, who's actually in charge. You know, them lot going up there don't really know what's going to happen to them in the second or two, do they? They're going to love every minute of it, Fred, they really are. And as for nerve-wracking around here, it tests you at times, I'll yeah, tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Quite scary, really, for the timid, it's, isn't it? Uh, well, that's the idea of the business, mm. is to scare yeah. the pants off people, but do it safely. Mm. And that's, mm. that's what it's all about, really. Mm. How many tons of iron is there in There are 2,700 tons yeah. of steel in that. Yeah. And most of it was uh, manufactured and supplied not far from here. Yeah. In yeah. Bolton. Oh, I am. Oh, Robert yeah. Watson. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, famous yeah. structural steel plant. That's right. They made all the framing and all the yeah. steel work came from a company in Southampton. Yeah. Oh yes, it's uh, biggest and best in England. It's the biggest. I don't. I can't see anything in Europe or mm. England or whatever get going bigger than that at the moment. Mm. Fairly frightening to think of anything going that bigger. Yeah. So we'll hold the record for quite a while, mm. I think. Basically, the track's just two pieces of tubing, isn't it? Uh, a little bit more than that, but it's. <laughs> 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 but it, yeah, it's this steel tube track. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Our engineers walk that track mm. every day, mm. and then you'll have been on the first run mm. after that. Mm. Mm. Wheels take a while to warm up, but mm. uh, it'll be, as you said, it was better mm. then, it will be better now. Yeah. And Let's then it'll get back. to a stage Let's where it just back. keeps going. <laughs> Let's go back. <laughs> This is the third time round on here this morning, I'll tell you. That's it. I'm ready. <laughs> Whether it's a bright and colourful place of entertainment like this or somewhere much older and quieter and more peaceful, I can't help looking at things and wondering about the men who built them and about the great vision of the architects and the engineers who helped to create that wonderful, rich heritage of buildings that we have in this country today. What a credit they are to the men who built them. In splendid isolation as BBC Two treks to the remotest parts of the country in the nature of Britain next. 